it's a stark contrast between the way the world models leadership and the way Jesus said it should be in the church. He said that in the world you have those great men who exercise authority over the others. Um, but it is not to be so among you, but whoever wishes to be first will be a servant of all. We don't have to earn our place in other people's thinking by having a human position. It's a freedom to serve because of the position we have in Christ. People call it the upside down kingdom. First will be last, foolish things shame the wise, the blind see, and those that see are blind. A survey of Jesus' life and the writings of the New Testament reveals an upside down kind of leadership. Jesus turned leadership on its head, and in the process, he initiated the greatest revolution the world has ever seen. We're so used to concepts of leadership being from the top, being based on your position, your authority derives from the position. Uh, but one of the uh, extraordinary things about Jesus is that he had no position, uh, he had no real status or social standing, uh, and yet everybody referred to him as, uh, we, we've never heard anyone who speaks with his authority. And so the leadership that Jesus exerted was of a completely different type. Over the past several decades, there's been a massive shift in the landscape of the church. Emphasis is moving from a meeting in a building to being the church in every aspect of life. Church outside the walls. We, we don't see Jesus functioning in meetings. Uh, in fact, there's actually nothing uh, about the life of Jesus and the way he lived with his disciples that looks anything like what we would more typically call church. Uh, and so the, the nature of Jesus' leadership, it's really looking at the force of his life, of his character uh, in everyday situations. And there's this sense that the world is looking for people who will lead in every sphere of life. So Jesus led differently, paradoxically, dependent on his Father. Could it be that by learning how Jesus led, we might better impact the world around us? Could deeper insight into the leadership principles of the New Testament help us better serve those with whom we walk? While theologies develop and debates rage around the terms and instructions surrounding leadership in the Bible, there's a simpler approach. By looking at the heart of the message and leaving room for varying interpretations, we might come one step closer to leading the way Jesus did. I hear many people that are in simple churches decry leadership, reject it, probably because they've seen leadership in the past that's been self-serving. So they've avoided it. And that has, I think, hindered uh, the growth and maturity of the body of Christ that's involved in the simple church. I, I love Martin Luther's quote about the church being like a drunken horseman. Prop him up on one side, he falls off on the other. And so I think the tendency early on was uh, leadership was often overbearing, abusive, those kinds of things in the traditional church. And now we're going to go the opposite side. We're not going to have any leaders. We're not going to, you know, we're just going to all get together and listen to Jesus and see what happens. And I think a lot of us have tried that and we found out that that doesn't work either. Good leadership is just a wonderful gift to the body of Christ. In fact, um, the New Testament describes leaders as gifts. So it is very needed, but instead of pulling people from the top, you're pushing them from the bottom into their destiny. Romans 12 says, having therefore gifts that differ, let us use them. And one of the gifts it lists is leadership, where it says, if you lead, then lead with diligence. Lead with diligence. There is no doubt that Christian leaders across America and around the world seek to lead with diligence. They want to lead well, with excellence. Here's a problem we run into for literally centuries, if not millennia, the church has functioned under the idea that leadership is hierarchical, positional, and top-down. That leader is viewed as they're the experts, they know everything, they've done the formal training. It's almost as if they hear the Lord in a way that maybe others don't. It's the top-down leadership where uh, you know, I sit at the feet of the leader and listen to him and, and he is supposed to educate me in all things. Now, um, because that's all we know, we read the New Testament with lenses on <laughs> that, that see leadership that way. So when we see Paul talk about elders, 
and list qualifications. We think these are checklists to determine who gets to rise in the organization to the level of control and management. And I don't think that's in the New Testament. I think that's reading into the New Testament with these lenses that we wear. Once you take those lenses off, you read the New Testament and it comes alive in a whole nother way. So that suddenly now, uh, you, you don't see the church as an event or an organization that needs to be managed or even led into a vision that you have received. Now, you see church as a spiritual family. Despite thousands of years of thinking to the contrary, being a leader does not mean holding a position within a hierarchy. If it's not about positions, what is it about? Before the New Testament touches on elders and deacons, before Paul wrote about apostles and prophets, before any of this teaching, Jesus showed us through his life what it meant to be a servant of all. And the Lord led me into this. I was served by someone who laid his life down Ask me, where on me can you stand to reach your destiny in Christ? So I've seen it work. It works a whole lot better for the leader when he dies and serves everyone. And it works a whole lot better for those who are being led when they have a leader at their feet leading them like that. It's, it's the leadership that seeks to serve and equip and to release people um, in whatever the Lord has for them instead of the, the top down where I have the vision and you serve me and make mine happen. Uh, servant leadership is difficult. You cannot be a servant leader to a thousand people or a hundred people um, because it's very invested, it's, it's drawing from me. Um, you know, being a servant leader is sort of like nursing a baby. Um, you can only do a couple of those and really do it well. Servant leadership means focusing on the needs, dreams, and visions of others. Take personal ambition out of the equation. Be ambitious for those you serve. I would like to see a revolution of people um, in leadership that would uh, prefer one another over themselves, that would be willing to be nameless and faceless. And in the example of a parent, where a parent considers their children more important and are willing to sacrifice um, so many things in order that that child would be better than they were and go farther and achieve more in life. And that leader does not worry about how he or she leads. That's not their concern at all. They're not thinking, why am I doing the right thing to lead? No, not at all. They are asking the question constantly, okay, what, what does God want Joe to do? What does God want Mary to do? And these other new leaders that are looking to me for many, what does God want them to do? And so leadership becomes about everyone else, regardless of the context. It's said that leadership is influence, and influence is the power to affect people. When Jesus washed his disciples' feet, his influence was profound. It's not the typical picture of leadership, a man washing feet, but like Jesus said, he's not looking for typical leaders. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. The New Testament clearly uses some terminology that often people associate with leadership. Uh, and I think there's a challenge here in a couple of ways. For example, it uses terms like apostles and prophets or elders and deacons. Uh, and because we're so used to leadership being tied to a position, we automatically think of these terms as a position rather than perhaps a description of the responsibilities that were entailed. Uh, and I don't believe New Testament leadership derives itself from a position. Uh, but these terms become descriptions of what someone is doing. Years of tradition and learning from worldly leadership make it difficult to separate roles from positions. We like things to be concrete. We like to understand things completely. When it comes to the Bible's teaching on leadership, it's not black and white. There's a tendency in Christian circles to be overly dogmatic. Uh, and to, to try and be clear where sometimes the Bible is not clear. Uh, and to me, uh, this area of the terms used in the New Testament and how they apply to Christian leadership uh, would be a classic example of that. 
Uh, so now you start looking at this and, and saying, first of all, the Bible doesn't say a lot about it. Why have we created whole huge theologies around these words? Uh, and secondly, let, let's be gracious. Let's have openness to different ways of understanding how these terms are used. The Bible doesn't spell out all the answers. It does, however, paint a picture of Christian leadership in different contexts. We know that the church is more than a gathering. It's expressed in different ways. Maybe it's a group of friends or coworkers, or 10,000 college students at a rally. In each context, leadership looks different. At the level of an individual simple church, one metaphor stands out. Church equals family. That one simple statement uh, allows us to explain all kinds of things if we really take that seriously. And that leads then to a second equation that goes like this. Leaders equal parents. We think the best metaphor, the best picture, is that of spiritual moms and dads. And almost all that you need to think about in terms of leadership can be thought about that way. Their role it isn't a formal role. It's a, maybe it's a life-forming role, but not a formal role. And so they're, they're acting as parents, they're parenting that group. It's much more of a, a facilitation than it is a, a formal leadership role as we might think of it in the world. Parenting is an ongoing endeavor. Family is still family when they're not together. Likewise, church is still church when believers are not in a meeting. The leader's role, like that of a parent, is to help the children mature. When your children are small, when they're young, they need more teaching, more input. But little by little, day by day, as your kids get older, um, you do less and less telling and more and more asking. So that by the time they're 16, 17, 18 years old, um, they're the ones that are thinking through things for themselves. So leadership, like parenting, must be developmental. And so the same thing is true for a house church. Early on, the leader might have to give a lot of input, a lot of direction. But uh, over time, that begins to diminish as people take more and more responsibility for themselves. You're learning in the process of it, and so you become even more dependent upon God. And so you're not, you, you don't know everything, you don't um, have the ten principles down to a T, and so, you know, it all becomes kind of rote. When a simple church does gather together, the job of the leader couldn't be more different from what people typically think of as a church leader's job. A good leader in a simple church is not one who's going to be, who's going to love to do monologues. I mean, that's scripturally speaking, that, that's it's prohibited. It's to the one another, we're to teach one another, we're to exhort one another, uh, and everyone's to do it. Now, the better the teacher, and from the, at least the viewpoint of the average typical church, they want a teacher who's eloquent and articulate, can hold the audience spellbound, that will kill the average simple church. Because that cancels out the one another dynamics. You don't want that kind of teacher. You want a bad teacher. The leader takes on a new form. He's not the one standing up giving a ser sermon. He's not the one who is directing the meeting. He is the one who is listening to the Holy Spirit, praying during the meeting, uh, serving. And the church doesn't end when the meeting's over. Leaders in a simple church function like parents in a family. But what happens when you move beyond one simple church? A good leader must realize one very important fact. <clears throat> one simple church normally is way too small to have all the gifts to do all of the ministries that the New Testament requires. I've been, never known one church that could. So the way, only way we can obey those commands to do those is by networking closely with other simple churches the way the apostles' churches did. And if a simple church is not networking closely with others, they very quickly become ingrown legalistic, ineffective, and cease to reproduce. Uh, we need to see these churches networking with each other uh, and sharing the different giftings that God's put within that wider family, the extended family. The New Testament does recognize a wider expression of church. You'll see it called the church in a city or sometimes in a region. These networks were often overseen by elders and deacons who served as parents to the city. Networks are led by teams, not individuals. 
God usually puts in place leaders with different gifts whose role is to equip believers for ministry. There's this other form of leadership, more um, regional in influence, and that's the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. They all have unique qualities and giftings, and their whole purpose is not to do the ministry for others, but to equip others to do the ministry. So if you think of the implications of this, I used to think that the gift of teaching was the bottleneck of church, because man, you find a good teacher who's really smart, Everybody's impressed, they all want to hear him talk and, or her, and they'll show up and they'll just listen to that person. Nobody will think, man, I can do this myself. And so it stops reproduction. Till I began to realize the role of these is not to do the ministry. These five, apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher, they're not called to the ministry. They're called to equip the saints for ministry. So you think about it, the evangelist is not called to reach the lost. The evangelist is called to equip the saints to reach the lost. So let's carry that over to the teacher again. The teacher is not called to teach the saints, but to equip the saints to teach. And so these five roles can release um, influence of others in the world, and they all represent a part of Christ. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers often travel around a region helping and equipping believers in numerous simple churches. Depending on the context, their influence may be fairly local or extremely far-reaching. Uh, a ministry like Campus Crusade for Christ and someone like Bill Bright who started it, uh, you know, a classic example of an evangelist who's never going to be contained by a house church context, but whose gift is going to make room for him. The Lord uses these gifts in amazing ways, but they're not rigid and they're not positions. When it comes to the five gifts, I, I really hesitate to tell people to bear the title. Our authority doesn't flow from our title. It flows from our relationship with the Father. This is where authority flows down from, through the Son, to whom all authority has been given, and in Him we share in that. And so we, don't, we shouldn't need the title. Even when we read the Bible passages about these different gifts, but we see it through the lenses of this hierarchy, it creates a monster. Yeah, I don't even think we realize what happens when we remove this hierarchical system of leadership in the church. It, it, it evaporates problems that have plagued us for centuries. You know, Suddenly there's no more positional authority, so we lose the abuse of power, the protection of a position, the marginalization of the common Christian. Women are equally empowered to do the work of the ministry as men are because it's not about position, it's about who you are in Christ. So leadership emerges in every expression of church, from a small house church to a national ministry. But never forget, you are the church. Where you go, the church goes. If God's gifted you with leadership, lead with diligence, wherever you are. When a person is passionate about Jesus, they, they want to give their all to Him. They want to find a way to really let that shape and influence uh, everything about who they are. Uh, but when they feel the only way to channel that is into so-called Christian leadership or Christian ministry, uh, that can be a real damper uh, on their faith. Uh, because not everybody's passion is for sort of classic expressions of Christian ministry. Uh, they may be passionate for Jesus while loving the idea of being a nurse. Uh, and so they're looking for a way to express it where they can really serve people. Uh, and for the, someone who wanted to be a nurse to feel that if they really were following Jesus, what they'd do is go into pastoral leadership, would be missing the point completely. Uh, we need to take these uh, gifts, these uh, things that are God-given and built inside us and find a way to express our love for Jesus right in the middle of the things that He's made us passionate about. When people take this seriously and everyone leads according to their gifts without waiting for formal training or an official position, the world will be transformed. But we have to be willing to lose control. The Holy Spirit can be trusted to keep people on track. That's one of the criticisms I hear a lot, that it's going to become a cult or that this group is going to go off in heresy. We haven't found a lot of heresy in these church planning movements. There are heresies, but oftentimes a heresy takes a, a, a lot more effort to cook up than you have time for when you have a full-time job and you're doing church you know, with several others. But for a leader to get the proper training for a simple church, way out ahead of anything, and I've got over 40 years of experience with that, I can say it with uh, absolute certainty, Mentoring the way Jesus and the Apostle Paul did, there's nothing compares to it. It is explosive. It is reproductive. 
It is how to reach the masses. And it's been proven over and over and over and over in scripture, throughout history, and today around the world. So in a global scale, what we really need is not so much to produce leaders that can control and manage, but to empower people who can hear God's voice. And if you have everybody hearing God's voice, Jesus will speak and people will know what to do. And, it, and just, it's hard to even fathom the implications of this. His kingdom would truly transform a place. It would be as though Christ were reigning and we were all listening to him. What would the world look like? Well, that's, that's ultimately where we have to go. In order to get there, in a sense, we have to get away from this top-down authoritative positional leadership because it is cutting off the head from the body. We need leaders that are enabling others to hear God's voice, empowering them to follow God's lead courageously. And if we have that and we release that, I think we'll see the world transformed by the kingdom of God because Jesus will be reigning. The king will be in charge.